Welcome back to another one of our six questions programs. I'm Trent England for Save Our States and really glad to have with me uh, somebody I've known for a long time. We both hail from Washington State originally. Hans Zeiger is the president of the Jack Miller Center and a former Washington State representative. Hans, good morning. Hey, good morning. Thanks so much, Trent, Harry, for having me on. Yeah, it's, it's great to have you here. And uh, I, I want to start with a really straightforward question. Uh, what What is the Jack Miller Center? Well, the Jack Miller Center is a um, nonprofit organization that works across the country with uh, civics teachers and scholars of American political thought and history um, uh, to reach the next generation uh, with the main ideas, the central ideas of American self-government. And uh, this is essential work in America. Uh, civic education is, is not just something that's nice to do. It's something that we must do because we are all together. Uh, you know, all, all of us are responsible for um, governing ourselves. And so that requires a certain kind of education. And uh, the, the Jack Miller Center was started in 2004 by, by Jack Miller. Um, Jack was uh, an entrepreneur who had started a very successful, he started and, and uh, made his company very successful in the office products industry and um, uh, sold that in 2000, excuse me, in uh, 1998 to Staples and uh, realized that uh, civic education was, was not going very well in the country, that these fundamental principles that really um, are, are the basis for people to be able to pursue their American dream um, were at risk uh, in terms of the, the way that they were um, being taught or not being taught. And uh, so he, he he was concerned specifically about the state of civic education on American college campuses. So he called together 50 professors in Chicago in 2004. And um, uh, they, they had a very, <laughs> it was a very discouraging conversation about the state of civic education on college campuses. And um but Jack said, I want to do something about this. And so um, the Jack Miller Center was started as really a way to build networks of professors, to bring professors into um, a, a summer institute program when they're just getting started in their career, to provide opportunities for them to start and maintain uh, campus centers where they can bring in speakers, where they can have reading groups for undergraduates, um, where they can have postdoctoral uh, fellowships. Um, and we sponsor um, an, an academic journal for them to be able to get published so that, that that helps them in their pursuit of tenure, things like that. So we've built out this network now of over a thousand professors across 300 campuses in the country. Um, it's been very quiet work, very important work. And then in the course of time came to realize uh, there's this huge need in the, in the K-12 arena as well. We've been here, we've been working uh, in higher ed, there are other organizations certainly working up at the K-12 level. But um, we realized that we have this unique opportunity to branch out into the K-12 arena. And, um, you know, what we had to bring to the table were the many professors in our network who we could call on to lead seminars for teachers centered on primary source readings in American history and civics. So we started that in the Chicago area several years ago, and then we started working in other areas. We've now worked in 10 states but the biggest impact that we've had in, in K-12 has been our statewide model that we built in the state of Florida, which is truly impressive. And, and getting started in this work, I've been able to, to see aspects of that. Um, we, we did 54 workshop programs for teachers over the summer. We're doing it alongside a couple of other organizations that also value the founding principles of the country, the Bill of Rights Institute and the Ashbrook Center. And now we have a very ambitious strategic plan. We're laying the groundwork in Wisconsin Texas and Virginia for additional teacher statewide teacher programs. And we want to grow our work with professors of history and political science um, you know, to, to reach college students, uh, as well as uh, to work with K-12 teachers. So that, to connect those professors with the K-12 teachers um, that we're bringing into our network. So um, lots to do, lots uh, of um, important work that has been done in this organization. Um, I would say, you know, in terms of the, the core beliefs that we have, we believe that America is exceptional. We believe that the core ideas and core texts of America need to be taught in each generation. And, and we believe that America's civics teachers are uniquely entrusted to do this work. 
So I'm talking with Hans Zeiger. He's the president of the Jack Miller Center focused on civic education. And Hans, one of my favorite Abraham Lincoln speeches, it's certainly not his best speech, not, I don't even think among his best speeches, but it's it's one of my favorites, is his address to the Long, Young Men's Lyceum. This is Lincoln as a young man. I think he's 28 years old. And, and he talks about how as the, as the founding generation is dying off, uh, we would have to replace just sort of, you know, the, the reverence, the emotions that Americans had uh, in support of our constitutional republic with some, something like civic education, you know, that would create a civic religion. And I, I have to admit, I always wonder, is that really enough? And I, I feel like, yeah. on the, at least on the conservative side, there's a debate going on about is, you know, is that enough? Is that just book knowledge versus, you know, true fidelity? Um, you know, speak to people who who worry that maybe, you know, maybe we can't do enough through education. Are, are there are there limits there? Or, or, or do you think that if we could just build a critical mass of Americans who really understand where we've come from and the, the principles uh, that our country rests on, that, that that is what what it will take for a national revival. Yeah, it's a great question, um, and and I bring you know an interesting background to this, which is that, that I come from the policy arena in my past, and so I you know, spent spent a decade in the Washington State Legislature, went into local government for a short time, so you know saw things from the perspective that we need to do things to change public policy. Um, ultimately came to the conclusion that we needed to do more on the civic education side to really, um, you know, remind our fellow citizens of, of what citizenship is about. Um, you know, you refer to Lincoln, I, I, one, one um, passage um, that I've been thinking a lot about recently is George Washington's first message to Congress mm -hmm. in 1790. And our organization, the Jack Miller Center is going to host um a national summit on civic education at Mount Vernon. Um, so I've been thinking about what George Washington had to say about civic education. And, and in that first message to Congress, he said, I'll, I'll just read here um, some passages here. Knowledge is in every country, the surest basis of public happiness. And, you know, we, we might say public good. Um, and, then, and then he goes on in, in one in which the measures of government receive their impression so immediately from the sense of the community as in ours, it is proportionably essential. So in other words, knowledge is essential uh, everywhere. You know, it, it's, it's universally important, but in a self-governing society where the people rule, it is all the more essential. And he goes on to describe the particular ways uh, in, in which a specific kind of education is essential. You know, he's talking about civic education. He says this, to the security of a free constitution, it contributes in various ways. And then under this heading, he makes um, a, a listing of different ways that it contributes. So he says, I'm just summarizing his points here. He says that a rightful civic education entails deep study of self-government, of basic rights, of the propensity of governments toward tyranny and the ways in which men and women can stand up for their own dignity. And it entails a study of the careful balances between order and freedom and between limited government and the effective rule of law. And it entails the study of the distinction between liberty and license. You know, that, that is a, 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 an incredible set of topics that are worthy of study. Um, and, and here Washington is not just saying, gee, we better make sure the next generation know, knows how a bill becomes a law. And, uh, you know, how many members are on the Supreme Court and how many branches of government we have. I mean, that my friend, Jonathan Greenberg, um, who's a good partner with us at the Jack Miller Center uh, in our work on civic education. Um, he, he likes to make the distinction between what knowledge and why knowledge. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's great to know uh, how a bill becomes a law, schoolhouse rock. That was helpful to me when I was in the state legislature to know that stuff. But this, the stuff that George Washington was talking about in his first message to Congress is why knowledge. Uh, why is freedom important? Why is self-government necessary? Um, and uh, for a statesman general like George Washington, who knew what it was to fight tyranny, to choose liberty 
and to stand for good uh, at the risk of everything he held dear, you know, to leave behind the, the place he loved at Mount Vernon for years at a time in the face of mortal combat so that we could we could live today in peace. Um, you know, for such a man, the, the, the why of civics was what mattered the most. And these are things that are deserving of study that must be studied in each generation that must be passed along <clears throat> in each generation. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we, we, we've got to take that seriously in our own generation. Um, and, and I think uh, we've neglected that. We, we've, <clears throat> what I really worry about is that we have come to a point where we are losing a sense of common purpose as, uh, as Americans and to recover that, we have to have a sense that the founding principles of the country really matter. Yes, there are flaws in our country's history, but our history is worthy of study, uh, that our country is worthy of celebration. And um, and so, yes, civics matters. Um, not to say that other things that, that we might pursue in terms of how we're prioritizing our active citizenship, uh, that they, they don't matter, but civics absolutely does matter. Yeah, it just seems like it's clearly the foundation of everything else that we we do in in policy and in politics. I, I want to ask you a question, a little bit more about may, maybe politics. And you mentioned you served in the Washington State Legislature for for ten years. You were in the minority, and I, I think it's an, just an interesting question. Uh, you know, you you hear uh, you hear people talk about you know not being represented when they don't win elections. Um, and, you know, sort of about the party power dynamic within government and legislative bodies. Hans, you were, you were in the minority. What's the role mm -hmm. of a, a legislator, you know, whether at the state level or, or maybe in, in Congress, I don't know if it would, it would be different, but at least at the state level, what's the role of a, a legislator who's in the minority? Uh, what, what do you see that, that job as, uh, as being, and how are your, your constituents when you're in the minority still represented within that, that deliberative body? Yeah, great question. <clears throat> you know, I had the pleasure of representing, um, you know, the, the community where I grew up, the, just a, a place where I had, uh, deep family ties, um, and really a swing district. Um, so, um, I was very keenly aware that I was representing not only, you know, people of my party, um, uh, but, but people of, of all parties, people of, uh, you know, independent people. Um, I had 150,000 bosses and sometimes that's challenging. You know, you, you have to do a lot of balancing when you're a legislator. Um, and, and I found that I could be very effective whether I was in the mi minority like I was for nine of the years that I served in the legislature or being in the majority for the year <laughs> that I had the privilege to do that. Um, got, to, got to chair a committee, the education committee during that time, and, and that was thrilling. Um, but being in the minority, uh, you have an opportunity to work on specific policy areas where, uh, for the most part, party label doesn't matter. Now, certainly if you're if you're trying to get a lot of things done, um, and you want some advantages, you know, being in the majority is a great thing to do. But I, I found that you can you can have credibility, you can win the trust of your colleagues on both sides of the aisle, and and get a lot done, re regardless of whether you're in the majority or the minority. Um, you know, I had colleagues I can think of who were in the minority, but uh, got more done than people who were in the majority party. And, um, and that's a function of building relationships, um, you know, of, of knowing how to rep represent your constituents um, and taking a, a real interest in the policy matters at hand. Uh, so, and I find that most people who go into legislative bodies, you know, you know they do so because they, they really care about their community. Um, they, they want to make a difference. And um, the, the, one of the other nice things I would say during the time that I was in the, the state legislature in Washington was we had um, a balance in the legislative uh, body for, for half the time I was there. So for five years, there was a narrow Republican majority in the Senate and a narrow Democratic majority in the House. <clears throat> and it made a kind of environment in which everybody had to um, work together. Um, you know, the, the Republicans and Democrats really had to pay attention to each other. And, and um, if, if you didn't, their 
things might not work out as well. And <clears throat> the legislative body as a whole had more more sway, I think, compared to the governor during that time. Um, uh, the, the really, were, the, the legislature was setting the policy agenda on a bipartisan basis, and things worked out very nicely. Um, we resolved uh, a massive um, a mandate from the state Supreme Court on K-12 education during that time, uh, increased uh, state support for higher education, passed the largest transportation investment package in state history to that point, and uh, you know, did all that on a bipartisan basis. And, you know... Uh, when when there's spending items that the Democrats want, the Republicans are interested in how can we get reforms um, in, in exchange for that. And so you have this back and forth about how do we have good government at the same time that we're spending money. And, and that's the kind of dynamic that happens on a number of issues when there's bipartisan cooperation. So Hans, we're, we're sort of working backwards in your biography. And I just, I couldn't resist this question because um, I, I think it's uh, I, I think it's so interesting that when you were a student at Hillsdale College, you wrote a book uh, and you wrote a good book. Uh, you know, that's uh, that's more than a lot of people <laughs> are, are able to accomplish in their lifetimes. And uh, and you, you did it when you were at Hillsdale. So, well, uh, I, I think I should have been paying more attention to my studies than <laughs> writing books when I was in college. <laughs> in any case. Well, it's a good it's a good book. I found it on my uh, my library shelves. Uh, called "Get Off My Honor" about the Boy Scouts. You you were a uh, you, you were a Boy Scout, and you you wrote this book. Uh, yeah, I was I was looking through it yesterday and just thinking how prophetic it it was about some of the cultural fights going on within scouting. That was 17 years ago, mm. and I mean, on the one hand, I I was you know I was, I was reading parts of your book thinking you know wow this is really for a college student to have written this. I mean, you know, really sounding alarm bells um, at the same time, you know, looking at that 17 years later, you know, is very depressing, frankly, because when you see what's happened in our culture, I mean, I think it's it's uh, things have changed so rapidly and you see people talking about the Benedict option and, you know, sort of, you know, do do people who are are. Uh, uh, you know, sort of have the values that were dominant in Western civilization and maybe just about all civilization up until a generation ago. I mean, do, do, do people like that have to withdraw, uh, have to create new institutions, uh, have to just keep fighting, even if it's a losing battle? Uh, I mean, what, you know, 17 years after writing that book, um, what do you think about some of those debates just as, as to what, what do we do now? Well, I think one, one of the th key things I learned in preparing that book was just the, <clears throat> the vibrancy of American civil society and, the, you know, um, the, the Boy Scouts as an organization, uh, came about in, um, uh, the, the 19-teens, um, you know, following the creation of scouting in England, and um, that was that that 19 teens period was such a time of civic flourishing, all kinds of civic organizations, service groups, um, youth organizations were starting up in the country. And, um, you know, organizations in America come and go and uh, they they rise and fall and have new incarnations. And um, it, it, it is one of the great features of American freedom that we're able to create organizations, create ways of getting together and doing things. I, I think, you know, Americans have long realized that the, <clears throat> the inculcation of um, values in our youth is just something that you have to have a robust civil society to do. I mean, you look at, at Tocqueville and he comments eloquently about kind of just the way Americans do things. So I, I guess that, that's all to say, you know, I, I, I think we're coming into a time, I, I'm hopeful that we're coming into a time of um, kind of new civic inventions, new new uh, ways of um, Americans saying we're going to um, reach our youth or we're going to take care of the poor or we're going to, uh, whatever the case is, whatever the, the function of civil society is that that uh, we, we want to achieve. <clears throat> um that we're going to create organizations or reform organizations as the case may be. So um, I, I'm optimistic that we can be resilient. I, I look at um, 
kind of the conversations happening among American parents coming out of the pandemic and, and just a lot of the, the controversies happening in our schools and uh, parents are, are taking things into their hands and saying, we want to do things that, that fit our values. And that looks many different ways, but um, ultimately we're a self-governing country and we can, we can adapt to uh, shifting circumstances. So on the whole, I'm very optimistic about our ability to continue moving forward and, uh, and, and the kind of adventure of, of self-government that, that we have. Okay. Speaking with Hans Zeiger, president of the Jack Miller Center, uh, question number five of our six questions, getting back to talking about our constitutional republic, we have just seen uh, within, uh, within a day of, of our recording this, the British usher in their fifth prime minister in six years. Why is our system so stable? And some people say it's too stable. Some mm-hmm. people say it's it's gridlock mm-hmm. and they want us to be more like the British system. Uh, but uh, what, what do you think, Hans? I mean, why is our system so stable and is it a good thing? I think it's great that we're a stable system. You know, I think one of the secrets of our stability is that we're so decentralized in, in this country. Um, and, you know, we've become certainly more centralized in, in our government over the last century, but uh, we remain a federalist system. And and um, I think federalism is just such a, a secret to our success in this country. When you think about, um, you know, how not all the power resides with the president or the Congress, um, much, much as we tend to focus on those things, much as power has tended to go that direction, we the, the states and local governments still have considerable power. I mean, I think that's that's worth commenting on when it comes to how we've been successful in this country. I mean, you, you sometimes hear the phrase American way of life. I just think federalism is essential to the American way of life. And, um, um, you know, federalism is is certainly about the balance between the national government and the state governments, but it's more than that. It's about an overlapping array of, of local governments that exist, just a multitude of local governments. You think about the multitude of, of offices in our local communities, you know, fire commissioners, drainage district commissioners, school board members, um, city council members. I was on a county council. Um, but but then I would go a step further. I mean, getting back to this conversation a moment ago about civil society, you know, federalism has broader implications than just governmental ones. It, it gives rise to the rich associational life that we enjoy in this country, um, you know, where people can start businesses to solve a problem, or people can join clubs, nonprofit organizations to solve a problem. The, the federalist experiment is one that allows us to have localized attachments that are truly meaningful, really to make a profound difference over the course of our lifetimes without having to nationalize everything in the process. So um, I, I think federal there's a lot more to federalism than we tend to think about when we hear that term. But we really have to celebrate that, acknowledge that that is just an incredible uh, a powerhouse of American dynamism and, and for the stability that you're asking about. Yeah, too. no. I, and, and uh, you know, speaking for Save Our States, I couldn't agree more with with all of that. I mean, federalism is right at the heart of our successful republic. And uh, I, you know, I, I think it's it's ironic that. And, and often unrecognized that the European Union, in a way, is is an effort to, I think, sort of ape federalism without actually understanding why federalism is successful. <laughs> mm. and, and so you see Europe trying to sort of build that kind of a structure, but uh, I think in, in many ways uh, uh, really misunderstanding why it's worked for us so well. Hans, our sixth question on the Six Question Podcast is always the same for our first-time guests. Who is your favorite founding father and why? Well, I um, I, I have a ready answer for that just because I, I, I have been reading Richard Brookheiser's uh, fine biography of Governor Morris. Um, 
and uh, highly recommend that book. I mean, anything by Richard Brookheiser, but yeah, but this, I haven't I, I haven't read that one, but but uh, several of his others. Yeah, everything he writes is just excellent. Yeah, no, no question. And you know, most people don't know that that Morris was the wordsmith for much of the U.S. Constitution, um, including the preamble. Um, he was a fascinating guy. He was an heir of an old aristocratic family uh, who cut his teeth in the political world right at the outset of the American Revolution. Um, was was really had a reputation as a ladies' man. Um, he he represented the represented Pennsylvania during the Constitutional Convention. Um, took part in the Committee on Style, which is how he ended up writing many of the words that we know today in the Constitution. He was later um, a diplomat to France during the French Revolution um, and just, you know, what was present at some really critical moments in, in world history, both in America and over there in France. Very independent guy. Politically, you could say that he was moderate. Uh, he could see the different sides of issues, had you know, strong relationships with people on different sides of, of the political controversies of the day, but he was ultimately, ultimately a man who devoted himself to the great themes of the American Republic, you know, and, and you ask, what are those themes? Well, I think you can pick out some very specific phrases there in the preamble to the constitution that he wrote. And he had this sense that people matter as the basis for a free society. You know, that, that just monumental phrase that opens the constitution, we, the people, he wrote those words. Um, uh, you know, he he understood that domestic tranquility was something you needed to cultivate in public life with values like civility and trust, that you needed to promote the general welfare and our financial and our civic institutions. And um, he, he loved this phrase, blessings of liberty. He, he used that in other uh, other writings and understood that those blessings of liberty are precious inheritances to be passed along in each generation. So um uh, Gu Governor Morris, uh, somebody I think we don't appreciate enough as a founding father. And um, yeah, again, I highly recommend that book by Richard Brookheiser. That sounds excellent. Yeah, I, someone told me once that there's a biography uh, of, of Morris called The the Rake Who Wrote the Constitution, but I haven't been able to, I think it's out of print. <laughs> you mentioned him being a ladies man. I And uh, that, that title always comes back to my mind because it's, uh, I guess it just sticks in the mind. But uh, no, that's it. I think you're the first guest to uh I, I think to mention governor morris and uh yeah i i thoroughly agree uh he is he is underappreciated the importance of all of those words and phrases that he personally uh put together put into the constitution uh too too little known uh, hans hans Zeiger, former washington state representative president of the jack miller center uh thank you for being here and i i want to be sure to give you an opportunity Tell people how they can connect with the Jack Miller Center and your work on civic education. Great. Thank you, Trent. And, and thanks for this opportunity to be on with you. And um, uh, people can go to our website, which is just jackmillercenter.org. And um, my email address is on there. If people would like to reach out to me, would love to hear from listeners to this podcast and um, appreciate those who are listening to this. Yeah, if you know folks who are uh, heading to college and interested in these topics, people who are teaching in uh, in school, uh, you know, in, in K-12 schools on civic education, be sure to connect them with the Jack Miller Center. Really, as we talked about here today, just crucial work to preserving, reviving our constitutional republic. Thank you for being a part of Six Questions and Save Our States, the work that we do uh, 24-7, 365 days a year to defend the Electoral College, this structure of federalism that is right at the heart of the success of our American nation. Until next time, I'm Trent England for Save Our States.